French President François Hollande appeals to U.S. President Barack Obama for help in the fight against the Islamic State. A closer look at a Freetown school that was used as an Ebola treatment center at the height of the epidemic. And from Russia with love, a possum diplomatic coup. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. We'll have those stories in a moment. But first, a diplomatic row has erupted between Turkey and Russia over the downing of a Russian fighter jet Tuesday by Turkish warplanes. Russian President Vladimir Putin is accusing Turkey of court stabbing Russia in the back and supporting terrorism after Turkish warplanes shot down a Russian Su-24 fighter jet along Turkey's border with Syria. The Turkish military officials say their F-16 jets shot down the Russian plane after it violated the country's airspace and ignored repeated warnings to leave. Russian Defense Ministry officials say the jet never left Syrian territory. Russia also says its pilots ejected, but that their status was unknown. Video from the area appeared to show two pilots parachuting down from the sky. Turkey has complained at least twice about Russian jets flying in its airspace oh, okay. since Russia began its military campaign in, the, in Syria late September. At this hour, NATO is holding an emergency meeting so Turkey can give its allies specifics about the downing of the Russian plane. French President François Hollande arrived in Washington, D.C. Tuesday to meet with President Barack Obama to discuss get, getting the world powers to work more closely to fight the Islamic State terrorists. Hollande hosted British Prime Minister David Cameron Monday and will hold separate talks later this week with the leaders of Russia, China, Germany and Italy. The White House has said it, it welcomes an expansion of airstrikes uh, by France. Meanwhile, British Prime Minister David Cameron has offered France new assistance for its airstrikes against Islamic State insurgents in Syria. Mr. Cameron told Hollande that French jet fighters have permission to use an, uh, a British air base in Syria to launch attacks on Islamic State targets. While the November 13th Paris attacks is drawing increased attention to Syria, where many of the suspected perpetrators are said to have received training, Here's more on French President François Hollande's efforts to build a broader international coalition to defeat Islamic State in Syria and in Iraq. Viewers, Ladisa Hoke reports. France said Monday it launched airstrikes against Islamic State targets in the Iraqi cities of Ramadi and Mosul for the first time. Officials said four fighter jets were sent from the Charles de Gaulle carrier, now in place in the Mediterranean, with two flying over each city. Since the Paris attack that killed 130 people, France has heavily bombed Islamic State in Syria. Our goal is to weaken Islamic State and to destroy it permanently. To weaken an enemy, we must hit the command centers, logistics centers, storage centers, and training centers to reverse the direction of things. But there is a growing sense that airstrikes alone are not enough to deter terrorists. The largest difficulty in combating the terrorist group is the lack of strong ground forces. Russia has acknowledged that its recent airstrike was not strong enough and didn't reach the target. Russian President Vladimir Putin met with top Iranian leaders Monday to discuss support for Syrian government troops. Moscow is an ally of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, while the U.S. and European leaders want him to step down. Assad is showing no intention of relinquishing his position. In a recent interview, he talked of his future plan for Syria. The most important thing for us and for me that the Constitution and the whole system and the country in general should be secular. Secular doesn't mean against religion. Secular means the freedom of uh, religions. It's the system that can include every religion, followers, every sect, and every ethnicity. Some Syrians hope the Paris attacks will galvanize an international effort against Islamic State. The European countries are beginning to see that terrorism is around them even though extremist groups are not inside their countries. It remains to be seen whether the French president can get disagreeing sides to fight terrorism together. Zlaritsa Hoke, VOA News, Washington. 
Well, Tuesday is day two of Mali's three-day national mourning period following the terrorist attack that killed at least 19 people last Friday at a luxury hotel in Bamako. As Emily Eob reports from the capital, the attack marks an increasing wave of violence in the West African nation. A few days after the terrorist struck, the Radisson Blue Hotel in Mali's capital city, Bamako, bears the scars of the November 20th attack that left at least 19 people dead. American embassy contractor Terry Kemp recalls how he hid under a table when the shooting started. Three terrorists came in, uh, started shooting. They were standing right next to me. When they were standing right next to me, I knew it was over. I knew they were going to lift up the curtain and that was it. But they did not, and Kemp survived. The casualties included Chinese business executives, Russian airline employees, and citizens of several other countries. The hotel, one of the most luxurious in the city, was a favorite for international businessmen and diplomats. Several days after the attack, questions remain. The author of the attack is still unknown. Two armed groups have claimed responsibility. University of Bamako professor Issa Ndai says it is a game of power between armed groups. Each group claims to be behind the attack, so the authorities will acknowledge them and their capacity to cause harm and include them in whatever negotiations there are. Mali has seen a growing number of armed groups during the past few years. In 2012, the north of the country was occupied by jihadist groups linked to al-Qaeda. A French military operation dislodged them, but violence has remained. At least five armed groups with links to al-Qaeda or to the Islamic State are now responsible for various acts of violence across the West African country. The attack in Bamako, the second this year, confirms the spreading of the violence that was once confined to Mali's northern half. Visiting the hotel after the attack, Mali's president, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, called for global mobilization. The challenge we're facing now is a global challenge. What happened in Mali has happened before in Paris to Moscow. So we have to strengthen and to join our efforts so to face the challenge. More than 3,000 French troops have been deployed since last year in Mali and neighboring countries to tackle terrorist groups in the Sahel region. The United Nations peacekeeping mission in Mali, the third biggest in the world with close to 13,000 members, is also one of the most dangerous in UN history with more than 50 blue helmets killed. A media up for the UN News in Bamako. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, Nairobi residents prepare for the arrival of Pope Francis. Stay with us. Health news and notes. This is Living Better. The World Health Organization recently put processed meats like hot dogs on its group one list of things for which there is sufficient evidence of a cancer link. The WHO put other red meat in a lower classification of colon cancer risk. University of Cardiff professor Robert Picard says the distinction between processed meat and red meat is important. The uncertainty is generated because, of course, you can treat meats in very different ways. For example, uh, if you're preserving it and adding a lot of smoke, then you can introduce carcinogens, possibly, in that process. Picard says, however, that people should not panic about their meat consumption. The bottom line in nutrition is to eat a little bit of as many different things as possible. Estimates are that some 34,000 deaths from cancer worldwide could be attributed to diets high in processed meat. I'm Martin Seacrest for VOA's Living Better. Well, a recent uh, statement by human rights defenders urges a coordinated global response to the escalating human rights crisis in Burundi. In neighboring Uganda, in recent years, the police have been accused of serious human rights violations during its handling of public order management. For some insight into the human rights situation in those countries, I'm joined by Maria Burnett, a senior researcher for Africa at Human Rights Watch, and Nicholas Opio. Executive Director, Chapter 4, Uganda, an organization that provides legal representation to the most vulnerable and discriminated in that country. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. 
Now, um, Maria, you know, Uganda has been witnessing a lot of action uh, for quite some time. Now, uh, tell us, what, what, what is, in a short, uh, in few words, the state of human rights in Uganda right now? Well, with elections scheduled for February 2016, we remain really concerned about the human rights situation. Clearly, the ability of Uganda's government, particularly the police, to respect human rights will be critical to having a free and fair campaign. So we're certainly looking at how journalists are being treated, how the media can cover campaign issues, how the public themselves can participate in demonstrations and in rallies. So we're very concerned about the ability of everyone to assemble in different places throughout the country. And as always, we remain very concerned about police and military use of force mm -hmm. during demonstrations. And in general, police brutality remains a really yeah. critical issue. Now, uh, Nicholas, you know, this has been going on for a long time. What somebody uh, gets out of it when you observe is that the government doesn't seem to care much. Well, um, the government should care. And I think that's the reason all of us, um, every time, continue to remind the government of its obligation to respect the fundamental rights of Ugandans the right to associate, the right to freely express themselves. It is the duty of the state um, to respect those rights. To yeah, but, it, but it looks this. like it hasn't really bothered to, to respect those. How do you make sure that Uganda, the government of Uganda, can actually respect that? I mean, we are engaged in providing people with the necessary knowledge about their rights uh, in order for them to be able to stand up to the state and demand accountability and de demand respect for human rights. In many instances, we are holding the state accountable by taking the state to court, suing the government of Uganda, and in some cases making some very good progress. Now, Maria, you know, recently actually you personally reported on the case of an opposition activist who was arrested, stripped, uh, naked. Uh, does uh, the targeting of, uh, you know, people, does it discriminate, I mean, what activities they're engaged in, or is it just as long as you seem to be expressing an opposing view to the government's position? Well, we've remained very concerned about the police use of force in the context of opposition demonstrations or rallies. You know, we documented killings by both the police and the military in September 2009 and in April 2011. So police accountability for the use of force in the context of public gatherings remains a really critical issue. And if people cannot participate in demonstrations or in even opposition meetings, that's going to affect the ability of Uganda to hold a free and fair election. Yes. Now, Nicholas, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the other people you represent, uh, you know, we have had also other groups of people who have been, uh, you know, seriously affected by the violations there. Uh, what headway are you making, at least through the court system? Well, there are several cases that have gone through the court system. The difficulty with the cases we are handling is that the arrests and the prosecutions that are undertaken by the government is not done with the intention of prosecuting. So the cases end up being clogged up in the criminal justice system. They take years and people have to report to court, you know, now and again. So what we are doing is first exposing this abuse of the criminal justice system by the government uh, in the pretext of trying people, exposing it and making sure people know what's happening. But in many instances, challenging those prosecutions. And in, in a couple of cases, the courts have dismissed those, 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 those allegations and um, people have gained their freedom. But particularly I think that what is important to highlight in the context of demonstration is the attack on women. We've seen increasingly gruesome violations of the dignity of women who take part in public assembly. And that's concerning for us. Now, Maria, uh, what, what would you want uh, to see happen? I mean, uh, the, uh, the groups that fight for human rights uh, of people have said there is a need for coordinated response. W what is it you would like to see the international community do? Well, we have a couple of key messages, I think. I mean, the first one that we'd like to see both Ugandan groups, international human rights groups, and frankly, Uganda's development partners pushing for, for example, is that the police view of the lawfulness of a gathering shouldn't be the basis upon which they use force. So the police use of force has to be proportionate, and it has to be based on the conduct of those gathered. So if police believe that a gathering is somehow unlawful, that police haven't been duly notified, that isn't a basis upon which to go in and start tear gassing everyone using rubber bullets or using live ammunition. Clearly, that determination is based on the conduct of the gathering, and peaceful people gathered together have a right to be there. That's going to be a key issue. We also are looking to see the new Ugandan Anti-Torture Act, it's not so new anymore, actually start to be used. We still have not seen a prosecution under that act. 
police brutality remains an important issue, and yet we don't see prosecutors bringing those charges. I think if we saw some police prosecuted for torture in Uganda, it could potentially start to stem the tide of impunity. Very quickly, what is the situation in neighboring Burundi? Yeah, Burundi, it's obviously a terrible situation. Human Rights Watch has documented scores of killings just since August. We remain very concerned about the police involvement in those killings. We have some specific cases in which we've documented that the police have been involved in those killings. And we continue to push the Burundian authorities and the police to investigate those killings, to have an independent and impartial investigation, to hold police accountable for their actions. So. The buck stops with the Minister of Public Security, and we hope that we will see accountability for those killings. Definitely a conversation that has to continue. Uh, thanks to both of you for your insights. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Pope, Pope Francis is set to arrive in Kenya on Wednesday to begin his first official visit to Africa. He is expected to address issues such as climate change, interreligious and ethnic, inter-ethnic peace and poverty. VOS Jill Craig reports from Nairobi. Streets are being paved, banners have been hung by the highways, and Pope Francis branded merchandise is for sale. All to welcome the pontiff when he kicks off his Africa tour in Kenya. We heard the rumors Pope is coming. We are very happy. Pope Francis will be visiting the Nairobi slum of Kangemi during his visit. Advocating for the poor has been a key tenet of his papacy. In his native Argentina, he was even referred to as bishop of the slums. Many Kenyans, a good number of Kenyans, uh, are going through uh, difficulties, difficulties. And so uh, when they see the Holy Father now living a very simple life, you know, he is now identifying, identifying with the, with the, with the poor with the people who are, who, are, who are suffering. Pope Francis is scheduled to speak with young Kenyans during his trip. And if this visit is like previous ones, he will likely urge them to work together, dream big, and above all, have hope. Luke Kariuki thinks this message will resonate with young people here. Some youths will be welcomed to the church, some will change their lifestyles. Those who have been abusing drugs, they will change. The Pope is also expected to address climate change, having previously said that the underprivileged are disproportionately affected. Lane Bunkers of Catholic Relief Services says climate change is particularly harmful to those whose livelihoods are dependent upon agriculture. When the weather patterns change significantly, where we have these extreme seasons of drought or seasons of heavy rains, this has an impact on the smallholder farmer. Pope Francis is also expected to meet with different faith leaders, an important gesture in a country that has experienced its share of interreligious and interethnic violence. Because the Pope addresses humanity, you know, not just uh, the Christians. But along the way, Pope Francis may find that he picks up a few new converts, like Kennedy Agesa, who says he's currently a pagan. Maybe when I see him, I'll change. The Pope stays in Kenya for three days before leaving for his next destination, Uganda. Jill Craig, VOA News, Nairobi. Well, it's time now for Health Report, and joining us is Africa 54 Health correspondent Lino Mudu. Hello, Lino. Hello, Vincent. Sierra Leone was recently declared Ebola free. Another major milestone in the fight against the epidemic that has claimed the lives of over 11,000 people in the West African countries of Liberia, Guinea and Sierra Leone. VOA's Jackson Vongani was recently in Sierra Leone and visited a school in Freetown that was used as an Ebola treatment center. You know, it is estimated that the Ebola epidemic killed over 3,500 people and polarized all aspects of life in this country of 6 million people. The government ordered schools to be closed to stem the infection. In the center of Freetown is one of the top high schools in the country. In the center of Freetown is one of the top science high schools in the country. Built over 70 years ago, Prince of Wales School is named after Britain's Prince Charles. The government converted a number of schools into holding centers for Ebola treatment. Prince of Wales was one of those schools. The field where they play cricket, football and other games 
was converted into a treatment center complete with a morgue. Um, we're having a morgue. Uh, Samuel Freeman heads the school's old students association. He also served as the liaison officer between the school and the MSF at the Ebola treatment center. He approached the school's authority to have um, the school as an Ebola treatment center, of which the request was made through the government of Sierra Leone. And Prince of Wales School being one of the leading school, government school, I think that we have no option but to give the school up. Well, what are some of the, the leftover effects of, of you having hosted uh, uh, an Ebola treatment center here? Uh, what, what would you see are some of those residual effects? I think that there are no um, effects or damages done. Records show that the Ebola treatment center at the Prince Well School admitted a little over 250 patients, of which 50 are said to have survived. Freeman says that before MSF handed back the school fields, it made sure that they were safe for the students who were about to return. The entire field was fumigated and the soil again was tested, it was retested. In fact, it was retested three times to see that it is Ebola free, of which we are happy as a school. Transforming a school into an Ebola treatment center is not an easy task. It takes a bit of convincing and many students and school administrators were nervous about having the school grounds used to treat Ebola patients. Samuel Freeman had his reservations too, but he's proud of the role his school played in the larger fight against you, the epidemic. Say, like, Actually, everybody was very apprehensive, even for me. The morning I got the, morning I got the news that Prince of Wales School will be used as an Ebola center, I was very frightened. But as I, as I always say, we are very happy to serve humanity. And I think that the contribution by Prince of Wales School made it very, very possible for Ebola to come to an end in Freetown and Sierra Leone, as we can see. Now. What are some of the lessons that you learned about this from, 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 from dealing with this? Well, I think that one of the things we, we've already learned is this, is body touching. Don't touch bodies. Don't touch bodies. Yeah. Well, what are, what are some of the memories for you, like personal memories uh, during the, the heat of it? Well, as I made mention, I walked with MSF throughout the quarantine and I saw it all. Um, it is not for me to go back to those um, dark days mm. because seeing somebody with blood oozing from his nose and the rest of it. So you saw some gruesome, yes, horrific so it's damages. Very, very horrific. Mm. Um, to be honest, that's my first time of seeing people passing off in such a way. Dying. Yes. They're just dying off. Yes, 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 yes. You know, whenever, in fact, I'm close to this area, especially where we are now, mm. the mall. Mm -hmm. This was the morgue, right? This was the morgue. Mm -hmm. I always go back to the memory of those days. Wow. Now, you know, Mr. Freeman told me that there were rumors that some barriers took place on the school grounds, which he dismissed as not true. Overall, the students were happy to be back in school and hope that the time off will not affect their academics. And that was some great reporting, Jackson. Uh, so tell us, were the classrooms actually used for treatment center as well? Absolutely not. Only the field where they uh, play soccer, the field that we saw in, in the package, were used as, as a treatment center. That's where the M MSF set up their Ebola treatment center. And you said in the, in the story that it was disinfected. Right, four times. Four times. Yeah. And the classrooms as well? Yes, absolutely. Well, the classes were never used uh, for testing or for treatment, mm -hmm. uh, but they did disinfect them at some point too. Were the, the kids skeptical about sitting, going back to school? There were rumors in the neighborhood uh, that obviously some of those children live in the neighborhood too, that the classes were used for testing and so they were fearful yes. uh, when they first started school and, and so okay. there was concern among them that they could have you know, right. contracted Ebola if they use the classrooms. So. Okay, thank you, Jackson, for the reporting. And that's our Africa Health Report for today. Vincent? Well, you know, thank you very much, and be sure to watch Lino Mudu's Health Report every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, why has this puppy taken social media by storm? We'll be right back. <laughs> If you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines.
In South Sudan, the army begins withdrawing from the capital, Juba, in line with the peace deal signed between rebels and governments. In Egypt, at least four people are killed and 17 injured when a car bomb explodes outside a hotel housing election judges. We stay in Egypt, where British Airways and EasyJet announced that all flights to resort Sharm el Sheikh are canceled until January over security concerns. In Nigeria, the lawyer for activists campaigning for a separate state of Biafra, Namdi Kanu, says his client is being tried on charges of terrorism and terrorism financing. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. It's a possum doggy diplomacy. Russia is sending an adorable gift of solidarity to France. Uh, the pup's name is Dobrynya, after a popular folk hero in Russia. The Russian ministry hopes it will take the place of French police dog who was killed during the huge terror raid earlier this month. The hashtag at Je suis chien, or I am a dog, trended on Twitter after French police announced that seven-year-old Dizol died in the raid targeting the suspected ringleader of the November 13 attack in Paris that killed 130 people. Well, next up, uh, HBO's medieval saga Game of Thrones is known for serving up graphic deaths of its lead characters. But when fan favorite Jon Sh uh, Snow was killed off, avid followers speculated on every theory and sighting that would bring back their heroic soldier. It looks like they prevailed. Game of Thrones tweeted a teaser posted a poster on Monday with a partial shot of Jon Snow's uh, ragged, blood-stained face and trademark hair with a simple caption, April hashtag God Season 6. Uh, the sixth season will air on HBO in April 2016. The Game of Thrones tweet was shared more than 35,000 times in three hours on Monday, and Jon Snow became the top Twitter trend. Well, and finally, forget film stars and pop idols. Internet celebrities are the next big thing, especially here in the Philippines. These fans are going wild for the chance to shake hands with their social media icons. They are at an, a new annual festival in Manila devoted to the stars of the online world. The Philippines was dubbed the social media capital of the world after a study by global media company Universal. McCann showed that Filipinos spend the most time specializing, socializing rather online. And that is what is trending today. Well, that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the morning, today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching from all of us in Washington. Have a good night. Welcome to Voice of America's News Words, where we teach you about words in the news. When the George W. Bush Presidential Library opened in Texas, all of the living U.S. presidents, past and present, gathered for the ceremony. One of the things that the Presidential Library's opening demonstrates in many ways is an end to the administration. This is really the last thing that he's going to do as president of this administration, of this group of people. The word presidential means having to do with a president. Presidential libraries hold the official papers from a president's administration. Presidential elections are when voters choose a president often a nation's top public official. Now, when you hear the word presidential, your English will be good enough to know what this news word means.